we offer all we are. So we're working through our Wisdom Calls literature that Jeff Smith put out, and we um, are working through on our weekly readings, and then we come back in on Sundays and, and discuss these things. And some interesting proverbs that he shares with us this past week, some things that we could think about. Um, and, and again, I apologize, last week I'm not... Uh, if we miss one, we miss one. That was kind of a rare thing last week, and so so just we didn't talk. You got to read them, but we didn't talk about last week's. But we're staying on schedule here, so we are talking about the December 3rd through the December 9th uh, text that we're given to you in your uh, weekly readings. And and if you'll notice on the screen, what I've tried to do is is if you see it in bigger that. I'm trying to highlight for you where I'm going to focus some attention on. So it's hard to, if I just put the whole thing up there as is, you wouldn't be able to read it up there anyway. And so, so, so you'll see the highlighted section, sections that I'm going to try to, uh, to emphasize with you as we study. So here's this first proverb uh, out of Proverb 13 uh, and verse 24. Basically, that's that, that concept of he who spares the rod hates his son, right? That, that mindset. We'll see more about that text here before we get out of this, this discussion. But... But it, it conjures all kinds of imageries, right? And when, when a discussion of discipline is kind of hard to have because we, uh, it, it, can, it can sound negative, but discipline isn't negative, right? It, it, it's negative in the what? In the, in the moment, but it's not necessarily negative in its purpose. The purpose of discipline is to mold, shape, guide, direct somebody into better decision-making and choices, Right? And, and from parents to churches to, to, to in various circles and circumstances, uh, it's an issue or a thought uh, that, that needs to be understood. And as he noted in the very beginning of this description, that discipline is a word with many shades of, of definition, right? It, it can come in various forms. And, and, and when I think of discipline, we, we might immediately jump to, to kind of corporal discipline where where uh, you know when i was a kid <laughs> you know the the jangling of a of a of a of your dad's belt was not something you wanted to hear right um and there was nothing that brought more dread and fear into the mind of a child than wait till your dad gets home because now not only do i have the punishment coming itself but i gotta wait all day and think about it <laughs> before it arrives but but you get it right we sometimes jump to only those things but that's not the rod of discipline doesn't always come just in those forms discipline can come in what other forms instruction right instruction is is part of discipline and 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 how else okay rules i i you've it's been a while since i've talked about family and, and that kind of thing in, in sermon form. Maybe we'll do that now that I think about it soon because it has been several years, I think, since I've done any series related to that. But, but when I talk about the family, I always remind folks that if we want our children to behave, then the best, one of the best tools we have is to have clearly defined it, rules and instructions. It, sometimes children are all over the map because there isn't any instruction and rules or guidance as it relates to to, to what needs to happen. Another word we might think about, Kent mentioned there, as it relates to discipline, is training, right? Discipline, again, might simply be the training or the educational process that is necessary to mold and shape uh, the direction or choices that someone has. And I think it was important for us to at least jump into that right off the bat, that when you think about discipline, don't always think about that, that you know, School teacher with that paddle hanging there on the wall, um, which are completely illegal, I suppose nowadays. But uh, but uh, but no, there. Boy, I could just right. We could just start going on that. I'll leave that one alone. But uh, but 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 you get what I'm what I'm saying and what he's trying uh, to appreciate. Re look at this. The, the next down paragraph. It is not uncommon. For authorities in both realms to lack the courage or heart to exercise corrective discipline. Is it fun to be the disciplinarian? Generally not, right? Now you're going to run into a handful of people in the world that just kind of, they're just mean, right? They're just mean. They don't, it doesn't bother them, it doesn't phase them. They, they just, but most people don't want to be um, in, in that 
role. I, I, I tell people all the time, and, and Deborah and Rachel could, could tell you a little bit about this. When, when I used to work summer camp, um, there were a lot of years where I was always bad cop. Uh, it was rough because somebody had to be bad cop, right? Somebody had to set guidelines and rules. and say, Lots of counselors got to be, you know, buddy-buddy, and they're the fun-loving ones, and they're breaking all the rules with the kids. And then there's the guys like me who had to rein it all in. Good cop, bad cop, right? That, that's kind of the way it works. You didn't even see me point. Um, but, uh, but, but, but it's not always fun to be in that disciplinary role. And yet it's what? necessary. And at times, all of us might, might find ourselves needing I think I saw your hand, Bob. The rod of discipline does not necessarily mean physical punishment. That's correct. The rod is a word used for measure. Yes. And the adult in this situation has to have the common sense to measure what discipline that child is going to receive, whether it be verbal, whether it might be uh, a rod or right. a physical discipline. But he's in charge. He has to make the correct decision how to discipline his child. Yes. And, and that... And that, I think, some times is where the trepidation comes in, right? Because we're trying to decide what, what, what is merited here. What, what, what decision or choice did this situation arrive at that what kind of discipline is appropriate um, in that scene? That's the hard part. But what sometimes happens is because we find it difficult to find the wisdom sometimes to know how to handle that, we just don't do anything, and that's not making it any better either. Um, but, but you're right, measuring the right level of discipline for the circumstance is part of that challenge. Go ahead. It's a matter of defining what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that, that what we have to be careful about when you talk about this, what is acceptable not, is, is not, to, not to overly define certain things to where we're just throwing everything into the same the same pile. Um, there is there's real abuse, right? Abuse is real. Um, and again, I always remind you if you if, if you need any evidence or understanding of that, ask any school teacher you can you can find, and they'll tell you about it. They witness it and see the results of it all the time. But 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 that. Not every corporal kind of discipline equates to abuse, and that's the hard part sometimes to, to find that, that definitive line uh, between, between the two. Um, but any, any person dedicating their heart to God, I think, will find the wisdom to, to know the difference um, in those circumstances and use appropriate measures uh, uh, to do that. And, and I always encourage folks to realize when it comes to children and parents anyway, is, is that kind of what we talk about in the sermon form, uh, the worst time to discipline is in the midst of anger because anger tends to blind you from what you're actually doing, saying, or now again... <laughs> You're not looking at a perfect example of that over the years. I can guarantee you there's probably times where my children could tell you that I disciplined them in anger. But it probably wasn't very effective because all they learned was dad's mad. They didn't, they didn't, they aren't thinking about anything about what they did or what they could correct or what they, all they knew out of that scene was dad was mad. Um, and a breath or two doesn't hurt, uh, to, but still the discipline needs to come. But a breath or two doesn't hurt because it, it can create the mistakes that we can often make. And it needs to be consistent. Yeah. Not, you can do this today, but tomorrow you can't. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think you're right when it comes to discipline, consistency, and that's and again, that's not an easy task, right? That's, that's hard to accomplish. I think even the Bible kind of illustrates that, right? Because I believe the Hebrew writer talks about the idea that we, we kind of tolerated the, the failures of human discipline, but... but it, we deal with that, well, why not accept the pure, righteous discipline of God? If I've got to deal with the other in its failed and, and frail means, well, God's discipline is always correct and always perfect. But anyways, it shines light on the fact that human discipline will have its 
mistakes and pitfalls. Um, God's discipline never has that uh, as part of it. Go ahead, Mike. You gotta be fair. Yeah. You yeah. can't be unfair when you're with somebody. Yeah. Believe me, I, I know that. Right. I think that's that. It's part of this consistency, right? Um, notice he says sometimes the discipline can lead to despair and estrangement, and then the conclusion is, well, it's not even worth it then, right? But again, that can be that can be a mistake. Um, on our part. Notice the full phrase found there in Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him. What's that final word? Promptly. Discipline in its most effective form happens in a timely manner. Now again, you you need a breath to get the anger and emotion out out of the equation for a minute. Understandable, right? But, but kind of ineffective two weeks after the fact, right? Kind of, kind of ineffective to come try to, to, to go back two weeks later uh, and correct that, that situation. Um, but, but yet discipline needs, needs to, to occur. Notice he said, whether the punishment is verbal, material grounding, removal of privileges, etc., right? Cor- it's got to be swift, and I, I like this phrase. Jeff said it needs to be swift and unpleasant to have any effect at all. I, I, it was interesting when, when the church in Moundsville uh, built the building that, that Cedar Avenue is in now. Um, it's a, if you've been there, it's large. It's a, it's a big building. Almost the entirety of the, of the upper level of that is all open auditorium space. Um, and, and uh, anyway, when they opened that building, it was actually a news story in, in the Moundsville newspaper where, where they come in and took some pictures and had conversations with the elders and talked about the opening of that building. But, but there's a picture, I've got a, a copy of it, um, where it said, a picture, depict the elders in the ballroom. B-A-W-L, it was the nursery. And they were basically saying that we've built this space for parents to have a place to correct and discipline their children. And, and it was just kind of interesting to me that in 1955, when that building was open, they literally emphasized that they created this space inside their building so parents would have a place. And, and I laughed a little because that was the alley here. When I when I was growing up, <laughs> but 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 there was a in all, in the, I see your eyes. You all know what I'm talking about. You folks that are older and you took your children out there, um, but but a place right you need swift and sometimes even in certain structures you need a place for swift um, and meaningful right meaningful. I I, I tell tell. Somebody said one time, well, how do, you, how do you try to get children to behave better in assemblies? And I said, well, number one, don't talk to me because I'm up there 90% of the time. Talk to her because she's, she's, she's got them 90% of the time by herself in that pew. But, but one of the things I always tell people is, listen, if you've got to go out, don't give them a cookie, right? Don't take them out and give them a cookie because then all they learn is if I act up in the pew... Mom will give me a cookie when I go back to the back. Um, if that would have been the case when I was growing up, all you'd seen was a parade, right? You're leaving the pew. No, it's got to be swift and meaningful and, and unpleasant enough to have an impact for, for discipline to work. And, and let's switch gear. Well, go ahead. I'm sorry. I saw your hand. The concept of unpleasant. We have to know our children. Yeah. When it comes to parents and children. And we know that you looked at Lisa, and that's it. That's all it needed. I was a little different. <laughs> you know, so you have to know your children. Um, I wasn't going to do a whole lot for me, but, yeah. you, you know, to know our children and to know what affects them without discouraging them too much. Right. Yeah, and, I, and I think there is truth to that. And I, and I think that that... Well, let's take that biblically. The Bible talks about even spiritually discipline. It talks about reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and what? And doctrine, right? So reprove, 
rebuke, exhort. The discipline may come in all f- kinds of forms. The moment may need a reproof, just a, 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 a reset, right? Maybe it needs a rebuke. Maybe it needs something that's sterner. And listen, you can't choose that. That's not what God would want from you. And sometimes it just needs some exhortation. Listen, you can, you can do better than that. You can, right? So, so finding the right moment and the right ways and applying that into the right circumstances is, is part of the wisdom that we need. Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, um, to switch the gears for a second, at least spend a moment or two on the spiritual side of this conversation. Um, as, as frail and as hard as, as it is in, in a home, um, it's infinitely harder, in my humble opinion, um, on the spiritual side. It, it is infinitely harder for me, and maybe not for others, but for me. It's, it's infinitely harder. Um, number one, because you're dealing with whom, generally, when you're talking about spiritual church kind of related issues? Yeah, you're dealing with adults. Right, you're generally dealing with adults, not children. It's different. Um, it's ju- it's just different. Um, you know, you're you're dealing with with uh, all the extra uh, ramifications of that. You're dealing with the families of those people that you're talking about and the conflicts that that creates. And and there's a whole host of things that 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 enters your mind. And I I readily admit I. I I struggle. I struggle with it. I struggle to, to know how to handle it um, and, and, and to, uh, to address those things. It's not, it's not always as simple and as easy, but yet I also remind myself that, that it's a necessary part of spiritual growth sometimes to, to at least say something um, that might lead somebody to understand Corrective decisions need to be made, but but um, but it's a human weakness sometimes that, that that we experience as it relates to that. Go ahead, Bob. Uh, <coughs> my dad told me one time. He says, "If you promise a discipline, you best follow through with it." Yeah. So that could apply to spiritual discipline too. If they know what the discipline is going to be got to stay with it. You can't get a good and let them all suffer. Yeah, yeah. And I would agree. All the various things that we've talked about this morning apply to both. Uh, the consistency, the fairness, the, the what's, what's appropriate in the moment. Is it a reproof moment, rebuke moment, exhortation? All of that, right, uh, has the same kind of connectivity uh, to spiritual resolve. But, 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 but I understand uh, the point you're making. I'll go ahead here. I started teaching 50 years ago. My first year at Payton City High School. <laughs> this may sound funny. It may sound bad. <laughs> but I'm telling on myself. I'm going to the camera. <laughs> Let me springboard just out of that for just a second. But, but what that did, Gary, was it, it, it set the parameters. It, 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 we, back to our, it set the rules and the expectations. And, and I think with discipline, one of the, that's important, right? It, it, it sets the, these are the, the acceptable and unacceptable things in this classroom. And there is consequence, back to what Bob was saying, if, if these rules and guidelines are, are, are broken, and, and again, I've never sat in that kind of classroom, so I'm cautious to, but I've witnessed teachers who have excellent classroom management and those who don't, 
and generally speaking, that's the defining difference is those who have set rules and guidelines and expectations and they will be honored and, and those that it's a free-for-all. Um, and and, and you'll, you'll witness that um, at various times. But it's all part of that discipline process. <laughs> yeah, 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 don't, don't tell him. I agree. Yeah. I hear you. Okay. Yes, go ahead, Pam. That one, I thought Jeff had a good, good thought. It says in the churches, and this not only apply to churches, but a member who is sitting and unreproved is in and of greater danger than one who's been corrected and then rejected. Yeah. And we've got to remember with that anger or embedded feelings that we have either toward our children or toward members of the church, mm -hmm. they can't be rejected. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 it was a wise thought, and I appreciate you reminding us of that within the, within the things that Jeff shared um, in this context. It's, it, yeah, anyway, we could talk all day about, about the challenges of, of all those things. Other thoughts you had about that topic? Lest I spend all of our time, let's move on to the next proverb that you studied this week. And that was Proverb 14 and verse 1, where he talked about this wise woman uh, who, who builds uh, her house. And we, it, it's interesting, and Jeff talks a little bit about it, and, he, and I'm trying to think of the time. I think his material is about 12 years old, I think. 11 or 12 years ago is when he actually wrote, wrote these things. So that might help you sometimes if you see the references that he makes uh, within the literature, it might help you to think about the fact that he, he, I think it was 2011 or so, 2012, that he actually wrote this book that we're, that we're using. But, but he makes the comment about the fact that, that, you know, basically from Rosie the River to on, right, from, from, from that time period in which, for lack of a better description, women needed, right, the, their homes and, and in some senses their country needed them. The, the, the men, for the most part, went off to war, and, and the folks at home had to kind of keep, keep food on the table and find ways to do that. And, and in some senses, the Bible even illustrates to us individual women who, who had not just occupations, but successful occupations, right? Um, who comes to mind in your mind when, you, when I say that within Scripture? Okay. Dor Dor right, lady, right, that you... Sellers of purple. I, I always comment when I talk about I me mean, seller of purple. Purple was a dye that was not common. Only the wealthy had the ability to buy things that were dyed in purple. And I've always commented, and I guess it's somewhat speculative, but anybody that is a seller of purple who's selling a high dollar item is probably has some means of their own, right? They 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 they've created a business that is in a high dollar situation. So. So I simply illustrate the fact that there are biblical examples of women who were industrious, who worked, even the, even the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31 is described as somebody who's able to, to, to do things necessary to help out her household. Um, I think that text even talks about the idea she can go and survey a piece of ground and, and knows its value and knows what's to buy and sell when it comes to those kinds of things. So, so always, I always want to remind folks that the Bible's very specific in certain roles and responsibilities he gives to, God gives to men and women, and I'll never shy away from that. If it's Bible, it's Bible, and I will, I will do the best I can to always present what the Bible says. But, but I think that sometimes people get the idea that, that believers in the Bible think that, that women can't do anything but get yourself at home and stay there. I know the Bible's filled with examples of those that women who are far more industrious than, than, than that. But that doesn't exclude the fact that there are multiple verses of Scripture that do encourage her to also be what? Yeah, to be that keeper at home, right? To, to, to be that blessing to her household. If she chose to, uh, to, to be a wife and, uh, and, and ultimately chooses to be a mother, then, then that's a role and a responsibility that she ha has chosen. Proverb 14, 1, the fullness. The wisest of women builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. 
Um, she, can, she can be that keeper at home and be industrious, and, and help, but, but she can also do what? Mistakenly. Yeah, be so, so busy with her own things that, that she's doing with her own, that, that she neglects or forgets that she's got a, a, a home to encourage and, and children potentially to raise and, and uh, an influence to, to have um, in, inside that, that household. And I think that's the part that, that we, we forget. Titus, Jeff adds Titus's comments or Paul's comments to Titus and Titus 2, when he said, teach the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, Kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word that the word of God may not be reviled or blasphemed. Some translations use in relationship to, to that. Let them be chaste, keepers at home. Let them appreciate that obligation and responsibility. You know, a wise woman will will. Let me say that's hard sometimes, right? Because you say, well, that's a man speaking this, but but but. Um, there's beauty in, in honoring your, the God-given roles that, that, that we're given. There's beauty in that. Uh, there's no shame in that. There's no, that that's not, it's not degradating and, and, and all of those kinds of words that people kind of thrust upon God's Word as it relates to those things. No, there's, there's, there's beauty in, in the God-given roles that, that He has uh, designed us for and purposed us for. And... And again, I think sometimes as believers, we've got to kind of remind ourselves of those, of those facts. If I believe in the Genesis account of creation, then I need to believe that God made who first? He made Adam. But Adam was what? Alone. And he needed something to contrast or to complement. To complement him, he needed to help me. And so God takes from his side his rib and he fashions woman and he presents her to, to Adam and says, and Adam's response is, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she's taken from it. Right? You, you've got this, this perfect, now creative human experience that God designed from the days of creation. If I believe in the creation account, then embrace those roles and, and gifts and blessings and responsibilities that God has designed His creation for. And never look at anything God has purposed or designed as a sign of weakness or, or, a, or a sign of, of holding somebody down and those kinds of things. I think, I think that, is, that is a mistake. The glass ceiling, you understand that phrase that I talk about sometimes? The glass ceiling, I want to say this, the glass ceiling has nothing to do with God's design or the creative power of, the glass ceiling has to do with whom? Man and society, right? If it is a thing, it doesn't have anything to do with what God has done. It has to do with humankind not realizing that it's unfair in certain circumstances, the way certain things are dealt with or treated and the imbalances that happen. But that's human. I think sometimes we, we, some people try to argue, well, that's because God did this or that or these beliefs. No, no, that's human. God, God created something that was perfectly designed and harmoniously established um, so that every aspect of human existence can be what, what He would desire for it uh, to be. There's no shame in building your house. No shame in having an occupation. No shame in, in being industrious. But, but there's beauty in, in being a a keeper and a builder of that home and, and to make sure that you're engaged in that in such a way that, that you don't become a detriment uh, to the very house you're supposed to be encouraging. Thoughts or comments that you might have had out of that text? Say it again. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes we read one text and we forget there's a whole host of other texts, right? Um, you know, I, I've always argued, um, you know, somebody might come to me and say, well, well, my wife isn't treating me right, or my wife isn't doing what she ought to be doing, and I'll just simply look him in the eye first and say, well, what are you doing, right? What, 
if you're doing your role, her role will be a lot easier. If you're, if you're honoring God, love, love your wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself. I always tell men, I always tell husbands, I mean, if I sit down with them before they get married, I'll say, listen, remember, you're the sacrificial one. So says the Bible. <laughs> right? You're a sacrificial one. Because he compared you. He didn't compare her. He compared you, the husband, as the one who is in that model or mode of the sacrifice of Jesus as it relates to your wife. Um, and again, no, no, no man, no wife or husband is going to be perfect. But, but simply because God has given uh, the wife or a woman, here's a role that I want you to fulfill. There are a whole host of roles and purposes he's given men, and they need to be honoring those as well. Um, and they can become folly to their household just as quick. In fact, the Ephesians writer, Paul wrote in Ephesians um, 6 about, you know, fathers. <laughs> Raise your children in the admonition and nurture of the Lord. He gave that, that commendation. And, and sometimes we, we as men can kind of we push that off um, on, on to, to our wives or the mothers. And that, that's a mistake. We, it's all, God gave me that job. Um, and, and we've got to accept our roles in relationship to that as well. But it, Basically, it boils down to they take care of each other, and yeah. together they take care of, of the children. And, yeah. 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 When they work as one, then it's an amazing thing that can happen in that household. Um, when, when, they, when they work overly independently, um, that's generally when the troubles come. But when that, when that couple will work as one, um, recognizing and honoring their God-given roles, good things will happen. Um, no one will do that perfectly, but it will certainly make it a lot better when we strive for it. Let me go to this last text before we run out of time this morning. So the last text of the week for, you got, uh, for our readings was proud of Proverbs 14 and verse 4, where, where the concept is where no oxen are, the trough is clean. What's the, what's the imagery there, by the way? Filthy. Not, not clean in the sense of yeah. pure, yeah. but if there's no work being done, then there's no right. work. Is what? It's dirty. It's sweaty. It's messy. Um, it, it it doesn't it doesn't always have a pristine uh, view view to it. Uh, work work sometimes necessitates, um, um, uh, you know, the, the willingness to accept that the drops, the stall is going to be messy uh, during during that during that that process. Um, why why do we dread painting? It's a mess. <laughs> it's a mess from the time you start. Because, because you know, right, there's going to be that much. You're either going to tip that bucket over. You're going to drop that lid on something you didn't mean to. You're going to think you don't need drop cloths, but you really do. You're, right? And it's just messy and hard and tedious, right? And, and, and it's, it's amazing sometimes how we just shy away from certain things because it just seems too hard and messy and difficult. But some things... Still need to get what? Still need to get done. Still got to get certain things done. And that may require me to embrace the fact that there's going to be some, some, some messy troughs for a while. Um, you know, and, and the issues of that. Where no oxen are, the trough is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of an ox. You know, I, I may have a, a clean barn because I don't have any oxen there, but I also probably have an unplowed field as a result of that. I, I probably have a lot of work going undone, or maybe I might even be working harder than I need to so that I can keep my barn nice and clean. <laughs> I'm wor I could have had an ox, but that's too messy. And so, so, so I'm actually making more work for myself. Now maybe I'm doing things with my own hands that the ox could have done because I don't like the mess, right? That's the imagery that the proverb writer is trying to get us to appreciate. Hard work and challenging things sometimes require us to be willing to, to, to get dirty um, in the process. 
he mentioned it this way, Jeff did. He says, sometimes a clean manger has to be sacrificed. Expensive food must fill the trough, and someone will have to do, to do shovel duty so that an abundance of, of crops can be produced. You have to break a few eggs, dirty a pan, and splatter the stovetop, but you've got your omelet at the end, right? You, certain things have to just kind of happen uh, in order to get the results um, and benefit you want. And, and let me add this before we wrap up this morning. Sometimes the, the dirtier the job, the harder the job maybe even, the less likely we want to be the one having to, to do that, right? Um, <laughs> since we're talking about oxen and animals, let's, have, have you ever watched a parade that had horses in it? And you've marched from that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know the job I would not want? The scooper, right? The guy that has to walk behind that and clean up everything, right? But, but the parade viewer, right? Oh, what a beautiful, right, a beautiful presentation of this, these, this horse-drawn float that's going down the parade route and it's beautifully decorated. And the parade viewer, that's what they see. They see this beautiful scene they don't recognize that that can't happen if that guy isn't willing to walk behind that and clean up that mess as that horse-drawn float is heading down. Sometimes we've got to be that guy. Sometimes you've got to be that guy. And, and sometimes you've got to be willing to, to do <coughs> unpleasant and difficult things because they need to get done. And sometimes that falls on all of us from time to time. I appreciate all your comments and thoughts for our, through our study uh, this morning. Let's bow our heads real quick and we'll have a word of prayer as we dismiss. Father, thank you for the beauty of life that you provide for us, the revival that can come within our hearts from the great gifts that you provide for us. And strengthen us in your service. Help us to honor you, uh, to appreciate your proverbs and the wisdom that's given to us through it. And guide us in every step of our life, just give us a heart of renewed spirit and revival every day that we just want to long for and seek out that great home in heaven in the after while. Strengthen us today and always, and we pray all these things through Christ's name. Amen. Lord willing, we'll see you all this evening.